Wilson. It's going to be. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Very happy New Year to you. Anybody make a New Year's resolution? No. I made a New Year's resolution years ago not to make New Year's oh. resolutions. <laughs> um, Ian, Ian, a couple of notes. I haven't made any resolutions. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we got? Next week, we're back in the community centre next Sunday, and uh, Richard will be preaching next week for his first sermon as he takes up post um, as pastor next Sunday. The following Saturday, the uh, 8th of, no, it's not the 8th, Saturday the 14th will be in the induction service, thank you. And that's at 4 o'clock on the Saturday in the community centre, and uh, uh, Mandy and Anne have been circulating emails about refreshments, so if you've missed those or you want to ask any questions of Mandy or Anne, have a chat with them to see what is still required. Uh, so that's, that's about it from me. John. Just very quickly, thank you for all those people who have already said yes, they would help out with Joyce. Um, if anybody else um, is able to, then if you could just let me know after the service. And there's a few of us just getting together at my house on Thursday morning at 11 o'clock. Uh, for a coffee just so that we can decide how we help out. For those who missed the email, basically Joyce um, is one of our frail ladies in her late 90s now, so unable to come to church. So some of you won't have even met Joyce. Um, Tracy, who is another friend from church, who's not well at the moment, <coughs> has um, been looking after her basically. And although she has a niece living with her, the niece um, works shift work, very long hours. So has just asked if the church could come in um, when she's actually working, which is actually only three days a week. So it's not too much of a commitment um, just to pop in at lunchtime, make sure she's been able to have a sandwich or make her a sandwich um, and give her a cup of tea. So it's not much, but it'd be just lovely if um, people could help. Got the wobbly, got the wobbly mic. Remember that, Anne, when you come up. <laughs> I spent most of uh, last year um, reading this passage from Ephesians, and I think I'll spend the rest of this year reading the same passage. You will know it. This is uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. I thought it'd be good to start um, with a song that um, states or restates our belief who we are in Christ. It's called The Creed. A 
We've done this next song just once, so it might be a little unfamiliar. Uh, he will hold me tight. <coughs> when I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempters would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold, he must hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He Precious is his holy signs, he will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost, his promises shall last. Brought by him at such a cost, he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He
That was an awful lot of singing to mm. start the new year. <laughs> oh, man. We need to sit down. Um, Edith. Eva. Eva. <laughs> Eva. Are you, are you going out? Are you staying with us? Where's he going out? Oh, no, we've lost our technical, our technical assistant. Let's pray to him. Father God, um, how we delight to see see the youngest and the oldest and uh, some of us in between uh, as part of your family. And we just pray for Eva now as uh, her love for you just shines from her. Um, may, may we learn from our children and may she know more of the love of God. Amen. Annie. vertically challenged (laughs) as they tell me in America (laughs) good morning and happy new year our God is the one who makes all things new we read in Isaiah 43 and Isaiah is now in your confirmed place verse 18 and before that God has been telling the children of Israel um, what great things he did for them in the time past. And perhaps we too can look back on 2022 and in the midst of some darkness and trouble, we can think of the good things that God has done for us. But this is what he says in verse 18. But forget all that. What? Everything compared, it's nothing compared with what I'm going to do. For I am about to do something new. See, I've already begun it. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. And I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. What a promise to begin the year with. Over Christmas, in the midst of all the joy and gladness, I couldn't help feel a great sadness for our broken world. So many things that happened just leading up to Christmas and even during Christmas. And we're going to think about some of those today and pray about them. As we begin this new year, you may have all sorts of feelings today. A mixture of feelings. I'm sort of in the middle of what I'm going to just describe. Some of you may have hope, excitement, anticipation, and joy. For some others of us, there is dread, worry, anxiety. And I'm often somewhere in the middle of those two. I don't know about you. Whatever things we face and whatever camp we find ourselves in, we know one thing, Jesus is Lord. One thing... Uh, Alan joked about new resolutions and I used to make many. I don't do that anymore, but I do pray and seek God's will for the year. And yesterday, I know one thing. I pray that this word, the Bible, will be the final authority in your life this year. Whatever else comes, this must be the final authority in where we stand. 
I pray that the word, the Bible, will be that for you this year. Read it. I remember once I was in a wilderness period and I was suddenly shocked one day when I saw there was dust on my Bible. That was a wake-up call for me because I'd read it so many times and I'd fallen away. So if that's you, read it, believe it, declare it, obey it and trust it always. I'm going to read a poem before we pray from the Celtic Christian and poet John Donoghue. Um, it's a blessing, actually, and I thought it was appropriate for the new year. So here it is. As a bird soars high in the free holding of the wind, clear of the certainty of ground, opening the imagination of wings into the grace of emptiness to fulfill your voyagings. I love that phrase, your voyagings in this new year. May your life awaken to the call of its freedom. Amen. So let's pray. I pray, Lord, for our broken world in all its need, in the midst of wars, rumours of wars, shortages and strikes, sudden tragedies and overwhelming heartbreak. But God, those two words change everything. We trust in your protection, in your provision and your promise of salvation. We remember that we, your people, are the ones with the good news for this broken world this year. To be salt and light just where we are. Use us, Lord. Use us to the uttermost. And we pray now for all those who are suffering in our church family at this moment, who are sick, who are depressed and oppressed. I'm going to name some names now, and then others of you I invite to call out names or to speak si them silently before God. For Linda, Vicky, Rosemary and Bob, for Tracy and Carl and their family, for Sally, for Bob Hoffman, for Jean and Mike. And there are others that you may know of. So in this silence now, just speak out the names silently to God. He hears you. Or speak them aloud. We're just going to have a few moments of silence. For my friend Margaret. Tom, a past member of this church who's been sick. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you that you know those all those, that each one of us is unique and special to you and you have a plan for our lives. Just answer the prayers of our hearts for them today. Amen. Amen. 
we praise you for the good news from Mel and Lillian in Uganda. Oh, God, we thank you that you are a God who answers prayer, that we can pray until. And what's the devil going to do with until? We thank you for the team who run holiday lunches, for Sarah and David and the team around them. We bless you for them and for the way they have worked so faithfully this past year. And I believe we now have 85 families that we are helping. And we are thankful that we were able to send them a Christmas card and other things to remind them of the love of God. And we pray now that some of them will be touched, <coughs> even now in this new year, Father, by your Holy Spirit, to ask Jesus into their lives. As we look forward to this new year and the new season coming to this church family under the pastoral care of Richard and Pam, and we thank you for them today and we lift them up for your blessing and your guidance and your wisdom in the days ahead. We pray for the preaching team who give your word each week. And we pray for Anne today as she brings your word that you will bless her, that our hearts will be open to what you are saying to us today. Just really bless her as she brings your word to us. We thank you for the worship team and the wonderful songs they sing and prepare for us each week. We just bless you for them, Lord. How music lifts our soul. We just thank you. And for that new song we just sang, Lord, we just thank you for that. And we thank you for the hospitality team and for all they do, not only each week, but in functions um, that Anne and her team organize. And we just thank and praise you for that. And we thank you for all the setup team for those who come early, I was thinking of them at 8 o'clock this morning, Lord, and praying for them as they begin to set up for our service week by week faithfully. And we just thank you and praise you for them. And so we look to you, Lord, in this new year for wisdom, guidance, and we embrace it with hope, with joy, and with peace. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Um, some of you might know that uh, Sally and I uh, signed up a long time ago now to um, home a family from Ukraine. And uh, they're arriving on Monday week, which is great news. Um, they applied for a visa beginning of September and uh, didn't get it approved until just before Christmas. So it's a, a father, a mother, and a teenage daughter um, the mother is, is staying in Poland for a while, while her mother uh, has an operation. But uh, the father and the daughter will, will join us um, on Monday week. So I would ask you to hold them in your prayers and um, hold us in your prayers as we, um, as we learn to live together. We're going to sing again.
Good morning, and I'm a little bit shocked to find out that no one's made any New Year resolutions. And if I was at school, I'd be telling you that I'm a little bit disappointed. Oh. But no worries, because this morning I have got three for each one of us. Um, and I think if you're going to make New Year's resolutions or promises... Um, it doesn't matter so much just what they are, but it matters what kind of state of mind you were in when you made them. Um, a few years ago, I was coming home from an evening out with some friends, and I'd had a couple of gins, and my friends were discussing quite seriously their next career moves. Um, and one said to me, are you going to apply for headship this year, Anne? And I was like, thought really hard, and then I said no, because this year I'm concentrating on my dancing career. So let's really hope today that the resolutions and promises we're making are a bit more useful and a bit more realistic within the grace of God. Well, when we belong to the body of Christ, our family, the family of Christ, we recognise that, as Annie was saying, we're all at different places and in different seasons of our lives. And life is really tough at times and at others really joyous. But whether we feel like it or not, we are all new creations in Christ. And Paul talks about how we may still groan despite being new creations and how the old is gone because of Jesus Christ. There's nothing wrong with us making New Year's resolutions because as Christians, when we make a resolution, it's in the love and knowledge of what Jesus has done for us. So let's turn to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11, and let's read what Paul's told us about being new creations. I'm starting at verse 11. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it's also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our minds, as some say, it's for God. If we're in our right minds, it's for you. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them 
and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. And therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And he gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ and not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. Well, the concept of changing people has confounded every single human since the beginning of time. Can people change? And how do they change? Why should they change? And there are thousands of good organisations in the world today committed to changing people. They want to change the lives of people who live in poverty. They want to stop others devastating the planet. And they want to change corrupt and cruel leaders. But what about how individual people change? How do we change our beliefs or our behaviour? And every single person has an opinion as to whether it's possible for someone to change themselves. And the world offers a million answers to this conundrum. And on top of all that, we live in an ever-changing world. And our personal worlds change as we move homes, we grow older, we change jobs, we have money, we have no money. We lose those we love and we gain new ones to love. How much we desperately want to change at certain times in our lives and others, how we hate change and we fiercely resist it. And globally, the world has changed so much for good and bad and it rushes us into the future. And I often think of the world that has changed so much for my father's generation. He was born in 1923 and he died 90 years later. He was in the air crew in the war he supported universal education and the start of the NHS. He saw the birth of television, computers and the internet. Well, back in 2013, we were watching Andy Murray win Wimbledon and we talked about the previous winner, Fred Perry, in the 30s. And one of my grown-up children said, do you remember it, Dad, Grandad? And he said, yeah, he saw it all over the papers the next day. And he said, well, didn't you watch it on the television then? <laughs> and the answer, that no one had televisions, sort of blew his mind <laughs> a little bit. Well, the world changes, we change, but the greatest of all, our Lord God, does not change. <laughs> well, how are we going to move forward into the new year? And how are we going to make sure that when we change and transform ourselves, it's in his purpose and not ours? Well, I think that God has created us to need two things if we're going to change. We need the motivation to change, and we need the means to do it. Well, we can only get a smaller bit of advice from the world. We need to follow God's answers. <coughs> Paul tells us that in verse 14, Christ's love compels us. And that's surely the ultimate motivation for us to change. I love that verse. God was compelled by love for each one of us to send Jesus to die on the cross and to rise again. And we should be compelled by our relationship with him to love him and to love others. And what better inspiration can we have to change than to know that we are loved and we are forgiven? Well, I don't know what you're like when you're clearing up mucky stuff, poo or sick or similar, but when we clean our children or others that we love, it does become a different kind of task. And a few years ago, I was ice skating after a gap of about 18 years, and as I crept along the edge of the skating ring, a voice kept saying to me, come on, you can do it. Well, was it the voice of God? No, it was the voice of a nine-year-old going, come on, nanny, come on. And 
it should get me skating a bit faster. So what can me, keeps us committed to change and committed to change as people in a church, but love. Love compels us to change. And as a church, if we're ready to love each other into the future and love each other into becoming the people that Jesus meant us to be, then how can we go wrong? And the love and commitment we show to each other, we should also show to ourselves. We should be balanced in our approach to changing and to becoming more like Jesus. We shouldn't be too hard on ourselves or others, but also we mustn't become too lazy. Well, surely one of the biggest fears and demotivators to change is looking at our personal failures or our lack of ability. So a bit like my ballet, I thought I could be like Darcy, but I wasn't. We thought we were more patient, but we find ourselves speaking sharply to the same person again. We thought we were getting fitter, but we've been laying on the sofa for too many days instead of exercising. We thought we were getting better at sharing our time, but we moan and groan when we realise what we need to do. Well, Paul writes to the Romans that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And he really, really meant it. He wasn't trying to be nice. He wasn't just being vaguely hopeful. He said it because the Holy Spirit spoke through him in order to proclaim that truth for all generations. Well, at times in our lives, we may feel broken. We're unsure that anything about us can change. But God is in, change, in, in charge of our future and his light will always follow the darkness that we feel we might be in. Always. And the love of God in Christ Jesus will stay with us through a broken marriage, through sickness, through terrible mistakes and through the sort of grief that seems never ending. And I know because I've been there. And I like this following quote because it gives us a gentle reminder of God's presence when we feel at the end of our tether. I might be hanging by a thread, but it's attached to the hem of his robe, so I'm not worried. I might be hanging by a thread, but it's attached to the hem of his robe, so I'm not worried. None of our mistakes or our failed attempts to change can separate us from God's love. And in fact, many times our failure to change can actually bring us closer to God. We realise how weak we are. We realise how much we need him. And we realise that we can rest in his love. And then maybe, just maybe, try again. So if Christ's love for us and our love for him is the key motivator, what are the, the means to changing? Well, firstly, Paul tells us in verse 16, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. And he means for us to include ourselves in that. God is in the business of miracles, whether immediate or over time. And therefore, we can reframe that verse. So from now on, we do not regard ourselves from a worldly point of view. And the same level of help, support and encouragement that we offer others, we are to offer ourselves. If we think of ourselves as new creations, we will act like new creations. If we see ourselves in the process of being transformed, then we will pray in the right way and we will listen to God in the right way. We won't allow our past disappointments or failures or voices from the past to block our journey forward. We accept that although we have our part to play, it is God who changes us through his Holy Spirit. So Paul tells us that we change by reconciliation in verse 18. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Something deep and eternal changed when Jesus died on the cross and the temple curtain was torn. And something deep and eternal happened in us when we commit our lives to Jesus Christ. 
whether we like it or not, we are new creations. (laughs) Whether we feel like it or not, we are new creations. We are being transformed because we're reconciled to God. And when reconciling love and forgiveness floods us, then change is so much easier. When we view change through this lens, it gives us a plan and a way forward in God our Lord. Well, much of what holds us back is our negative views, maybe about ourselves, about others. So if we align ourselves with God's view, we will find strength to change ourselves and the world around us. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. We are ambassadors of the one who loved the world, is able to perform miracles, and who can change anything in anyone if they're willing. So as we stand here this morning in the knowledge of the love of God that compels us and his grace that reconciles us, here are my three resolutions for us today. This year, what will you do for yourself? What will you do for others? And most importantly, what will you do for God this year? And there's little else I can say about that because these will be personal to you, between you and your God. They may be big, obvious goals that you share with others, or they might be small changes that have a big impact and are only known to you and God. A resolution could be an internal one, a change in the way you think about yourself or someone else, something that requires internal discipline, a guarding of your mind rather than action or behaviour. But when we change inside, we will see, soon see the change outside. And when love comes into the darker parts of our minds and souls, it isn't long before that love shines out in our behaviour. Alan and I briefly considered the old 80s worship song, I Am A New Creation, but it's not the best musically, <laughs> but the lyrics certainly are. I am a new creation, no more in condemnation. Here in the grace of God I stand. My heart is overflowing. My love just keeps on growing. Here in the grace of God I stand. Well, what will you do for yourself, for others, for God this year? This isn't burdensome, it's exciting. These aren't really resolutions that we choose for ourselves. They're goals that the Holy Spirit will suggest and nudge you into. They're not hard tasks that we work at by ourselves, but they're part of our godly transformation, where Jesus and our church family walk hand in hand with us. Well, what will God do in you and through you and in me this year? Who knows? But we can hardly wait. Amen. I thought that we'd, um, we'd close our worship um, first uh, Sunday of a new year with a very old song. <coughs> when I first uh, came to faith, um, we lived in Cow Plain. You recognise the words. I lived in, uh, we lived in Cow Plain and uh, I went along to the local church, which was a, a combined Anglican and Methodist church. And, of course, the Methodists believe that they've got the, all the best hymns. <laughs> and sometimes it's hard to disagree with them. And can it be that I should gain Amazing love, how can it be that 
I am now, I can say, and have been for a couple of weeks, completely pain-free. Um, and <coughs> the speed at which that happened, I can only put down to God's hand in this. Um, he has worked a miracle in my life. And I have gone from facing possibly the idea of becoming disabled because of being in so much pain um, and dreading possibly having to be in a wheelchair or a stick or with crutches for, uh, well, possibly the rest of my life. I was unsure to now dancing around like a crazy person in my mother's kitchen last yeah. night. So hallelujah, praise Amen. God. Amen. He is a miracle worker. Amen. Amen. What a God we have. Let's share that grace, shall we? And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.